Hey gang, welcome back to another video. Now as a maker, the new Fallout TV series is full of amazing props and tech, but the one thing that kept catching my eye were the metallic details on the vault jumpsuits. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I 3D modeled, printed, and finished some biometric sensors from Fallout. So let's get to it. The first step in my modeling process is to find a source image that's as close to straight on as possible. In this case, I found a screen grab, but I only need the greeblies. So after I cropped it down to a usable size, I can import it as a canvas into my 3D modeling software. I'll select which surface to place the photo, and then I can calibrate the image to make sure I'm designing at the right scale. In the case of this piece, I'm assuming it's a one inch square. So I'll drop pins on the top two corners and I'll set the distance to one inch. Now that my canvas image is set and calibrated, I can jump into modeling. The first piece of this model is essentially a series of rectangles. So I'll start by selecting the surface I want to create my first sketch on, and then choose the center rectangle option to create a rectangle starting from a center point and expanding outward with a dimension of one inch, both vertically and horizontally. I can then use that sketch to align my canvas a bit better before moving on to the next detail. To make sure that my model is symmetrical, I'll draw the left half first. Then once I have my sketch finished, I'll select all of my sketch lines and then from the create menu, I'll choose the mirror function, along with a center line for it to mirror against. Then I can press enter to create the mirror image. From there, I can highlight my sketch, hit the E key to extrude the selection and create the first piece of this greebly. These steps will then be repeated for the rest of the rectangular details creating dimensions for each level that looks in line with the screen used costume piece. The last part is to create some holes for what look to be socket head screws. So I'll select the lowest plane in my design since that's where I want the sketch to be, and we'll create a new circle sketch by pressing the C key and then entering the dimensions or just dragging the pointer to set its size. Once I'm happy with its position, I'll copy and paste the sketch and manually move it to the upper left. And for the remaining circle, I'll use the mirror command again to ensure its symmetry. Once everything is in place, I'll extrude the circles through the body to create the three screw openings. At this point, I also made a few adjustments to the height of things until I was happy with how it looked. And then the last step is to round over the corners with a slight fillet. The next Greebly will be modeled using many of these same steps, starting again with a rectangle. Because this Greebly has a point at the top and a rounded bottom, I'll also be using the line tool and the spline tool to do both of these elements. For the outer face of this part, I need to create a taper. So from the construct menu, I select an offset plane and set the offset to five millimeters. This will allow me to select a new plane and create a sketch on it that is five millimeters offset from the ground plane. Once I'm done drawing the sketch, I can select both sketches and using the loft command from the create menu, blend between the two sketches to create the tapered shape. For this piece, I'm making the assumption that it's 10 millimeters thick. So I'll rotate my view, select the bottom face of my model and extrude it down five millimeters to get me to my final thickness. With that out of the way, I can get to refining the overall shape by adding a fillet to the outer edges, which will help to smooth everything out. Then I can move on to creating the inset details, which is nothing more than a series of rectangles and circles being extruded to either create a shape or remove one. The last thing to do on this model is to add in the small stud details. For this, I'm using the sphere command. I'll then set the first sphere in place and then using the pattern on a path option, we'll place additional spheres to match the costume piece. And when all four spheres are set on the left, I'll select them all and mirror them to the right. I'll repeat this step for the remaining studs until everything looks right, 
making a point to refer to my reference images often. At this point, I'm happy with the designs and can save them individually as mesh files, which I can then import into my slicer and get them to printing on the new Elegoo Saturn 4 Ultra. With my files imported, oriented on the print bed, and supports added, I can send this file over Wi-Fi to the printer. I can also monitor its progress throughout the print and even watch a live stream of it working, which, if you've had resin printers in the past, is a really nice improvement. Fast forward a bit and my print was ready and it was time to take it out of the machine, clean off any excess resin, and get to painting. These prints have some small layer lines as a result of the angle I printed them at, which is my fault. So to hide them, I'm going to apply a few coats of filler primer and set them to dry for a few hours to ensure that the primer is completely dry. Now that they're dry, I can see a fine texture on the surface of the prints that I want to remove. Rather than grabbing sandpaper, I'm going to use ultra-fine steel wool, which should knock down the texture and add a bit of polish to the parts. With that out of the way, I can jump into applying my top coat. But rather than going with gloss black, I'm going to go with a medium gray. This will make the metallic layer a bit brighter since the actual costume pieces look like milled aluminum to me. I'll give everything a coat of paint, then a bit of dry time, and then I can shift to some gloss clear coat that I'll apply with my airbrush. This gloss clear coat will help with the reflective quality of the metal paint and will give me a good starting point before they get weathered. I'll apply a medium coat to everything, give it a few minutes to dry, and then follow up with a second medium coat, making sure not to over apply the gloss, which will cause unwanted buildup or drips in the finish. Well, that was my plan. I may have gotten a bit trigger happy during the second coat. It's not too bad though, and I should be able to hide that in my weathering. After 45 minutes, the gloss clear coat was fully dry and I could move on to the chrome layer, which will also be applied with an airbrush. You can see almost immediately how much brighter and shinier the metallic finish is as a result of the gloss clear coat and the gray base layer. This is good since the plan is to dull it down a bit. And speaking of dulling it down, I'm going to pull out a favorite weathering trick and use hairspray to create a water-soluble layer between the chrome and my weathering, which can then be scrubbed away with a bit of water and a brush to give it a grungy look. Once it's dry, I'll start by applying a dark gray paint, which will create a greasy look over the metal finish. Thankfully, this paint dries quickly, and I can move on to a second pass with a bit of dark brown that I'm making by mixing a bit of black into a medium brown with a bit of paint thinner. This will get applied randomly, and once it's dry, I can get to scrubbing it all away. It was at this point that I remembered that the hairspray likes to sputter and create these drop patterns. But that might be alright, since Fallout's aesthetic is pretty grimy. If you were looking for something a bit more consistent, I'd apply multiple layers of hairspray until you knew you had even coverage. With this technique, you can remove as much or as little of the weathering layer as you like. I wanted to try and have some of the high spots be more shiny than the recesses, since those areas would be more likely to come into contact with other objects. The last detail I'm going to add is a bit of this panel line paint, since I should have painted the screws black but didn't have a brush small enough for the job. This paint will get wicked into the recesses of the print, and will give it just that little extra weathering to sell the overall effect. And when I was happy with how things were looking, I cleaned out my brush and let these parts dry.
Now I'm still looking for good reference images for the back sensor, but I think this is a good starting point. I'd like to thank Elegoo for sponsoring this video and for sending me the Saturn IV Ultra, and be sure to head over to their website to check out all the details. That's going to do it for this one. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already, but most importantly, go make something.